Resurrection Sunday is that time of year when the fish start biting. I'm just saying. So when you call the office and you say, is PB there? Can I talk to him? And it's like, I'm just not here right now. We'll call you just a little bit later, okay? Not quite. They're not quite hitting hard yet, but they're going to be soon. My boat has started. At least my dad's boat, that is. He lets me use it a lot. So I welcome you into the sermon series, Rejection and Resurrection. So we've been doing our sermon series, Rejection and Resurrection. And yes, it is Palm Sunday. And yes, believe it or not, I mean, it just, honestly, it just seems like the other day I was starting to prepare for an Easter series. And here we are, four weeks into this. Here it is already, Palm Sunday. And if you've missed any of these uh, sermons uh, and you want to or re-listen to them, you can check us out on these different channels. Uh, subscribe to YouTube, our website. It's new. We're still working through some things, but it's, it's live and well. Of course, our Elmont Vineyard Church uh, Facebook page and our church app. Uh, take advantage of those things. Listen to them. Re-listen to them. Um, I have this later on in my notes, but I just want to bring it, I want to talk about this again, because when I share a sermon on Sunday morning, we are now in our app, our church app, Elmont Vineyard Church, go to your app store, download the church app, in that app um, are many of things, um, commentary on what I'm talking about, and there's also a devotional down at the bottom of that, and so what I say in this sermon, it's going to uh, also be on this app, and also there's a devotional prepared for you, and it doesn't take you long, right? I don't, I don't write tough questions, right? So take an opportunity um, and download that app if you haven't, and take an opportunity and look at that commentary, look at the, some of the things you're going to see up on the screen in a bit, say the app, and so that means they're in your application, and take time to do that devotion. And I would even encourage you, uh, take time to do that devotion, not only personally, but as a family, right? Take time to do that devotion as a family. Uh, and that's prepared for you down there, and it coincides with the sermon. And so we put that there uh, for you to take advantage of. The journey of Jesus was one of the most wonderful yet perplexing and supernatural stories to ever be recorded. Isn't that not true? Now, if you haven't read the Gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and some theologians will throw Acts in there, and that's fine. If you haven't read the Gospels, I would encourage you to just pick one. And if you need a Bible, we have Bibles here at church. If you're watching us virtually, by the way, good morning, our virtual family and friends on our Facebook page, we welcome you here. If you need a Bible, we have a Bible for you. So if you say, like, I would like to read the Bible, a physical Bible, not one on my phone, uh, just put it in a Connect card and send it in or put it on there virtually, and we'll make sure we'll actually send you a Bible or deliver one to your home, whatever you need there. But if you've never read the Gospels, I would encourage you to just pick one. It doesn't matter. Pick Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And I will guarantee you this, if you start reading the good news, that's what it is, the good news of Jesus Christ, if you start reading that, you'll not be able to put it down. Amen? You'll, you'll, you won't be able to put the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ down because it's good news to our soul, mind, body, and soul. So take an opportunity, especially during Holy Week that is coming up, to read the Gospels and get into the story of Jesus Christ and the passion, you'll not be able to put it down. God's word is filled with, a, it's, a, it's just a supernatural story and it has the power to break darkness. Any darkness that you have, whatever you're going through. The author of Hebrews says it like this in Hebrews 4.12. For, for the word of God is living and active. In other words, that God's word to us is still alive. 
like Jesus is alive, God's word is alive for us and in us. And we, we, when we read it, it literally comes off the pages. Ever notice that? It just infiltrates our soul, mind, body, and soul. You notice that when you open up God's word, it's not a coincidence sometimes when you open up God's word and you're in need of something because you're going through it and you just turn to that magical scripture that Jesus and the Holy Spirit led you to. Amen? And so it's alive, it's active, it's sharper than a double-edged sword, even penetrates to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges, now listen to this, here's the good news. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It judges your thoughts. In other words, it puts you in line and keeps you in line. Uh, it convicts you where you need to be convicted. And I know in my life, I need to be convicted of certain things that I do. That the Lord says, hey, put away those childish ways now. And come along and move with me. So the word of God, it judges our thoughts and attitudes of our heart. Right? Because out of the overflow of our heart, our mouth speaks. And sometimes it's not so nice. And so when we get into God's word, it judges those thoughts and attitudes. In simple terms, God's word can transform your life. God's word can transform your life. If you've never read God's word, hop in. Hop into the Gospels. It's a good place to start. start. Who's the number one person in God's word? Thank you. You're in church. You, Jesus. And I put it on the PowerPoint just in case you forgot. It wasn't a stump me question. Jesus. And in the Gospels, we read about Jesus. It's a story of rejection. It's a story of resurrection. And in Jesus, life transformation happens. I know. Because I experienced the life transformation power of Jesus Christ. He brought me out of darkness and set me on the path of light. Let's pray as we move this sermon forward. Heavenly Father, we love you. We come into your house. Lord, we listen online because we want to be filled with your spirit, with your peace, with your presence. And Lord, we can't help as we bow our heads today as a corporate body of believers, to, to pray for our nation, Lord. A, a nation that desperately needs you, that is hurting. Certain decisions need to be made that are not being made right now, and we intercede, Lord. Lord, the Spirit of God intercedes for us with groans that we can't even express. That's what your word says. So, Lord, intercede for this nation today, and may this nation hear the voice of God. And may we change our minds and our attitudes and fix our eyes on you, a nation, Lord, birthed by you, a Christian nation, Lord, no matter if people deny it or not, Lord. And so we love you. We praise your name. We thank you for the people in the house of God. We thank you, Lord, for those people that are joining us virtually, Lord. Heal our wounds and our brokenness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, by the way, let me draw you to our church app. And you don't, I mean, you don't have to go there. We do have multiple things on the PowerPoint. But I've already explained that in the church app, um, there is a devotional section on there. And I'm going to read the beginning portion in that app. There, there it is. Let there be light on my smart device here. And so the beginning of the story, it's kind of a continuation from week to week to the best of my ability. But in this, it kind of sets the tone for the rest of the application. And it coincides with the sermon. And it kind of, if you go down further, we got spiritual applications. And then we'll get into the devotional questions that you can take part of. But I'm going to uh, read the story as we hop into God's story and his word. Listen to this. It's always good to reach your destination after a long journey. Perhaps rest and relaxation will fulfill your journey. A visit with friends or family can be long and exhausting. 
There's no place like home, Dorothy said in the classic Wizard of Oz. Jesus had been on a long journey since his ministry and mission began upwards of four years. All roads for Jesus led to what we now know as Easter. Jesus wasn't collecting Easter eggs on his journey, nor would he hand any out. Rather, giving gifts of supernatural value, love, peace, forgiveness, healing, truly setting the captives free, Jesus would humbly call for a colt, Zechariah 9.9, and rode in to Jerusalem. The crowds cheered, Hosanna in the highest, throwing their cloaks and branches down on the road. Finally, they thought, our warrior Messiah has arrived. Long live the king. The crowd's shouts of praise one week later would, be, would echo, crucify him. Jesus didn't meet their expectations. And his final destination would be met with much suffering and hammer and nails on a cross. Total rejection. But little did they know a resurrection was about to take place. Right? A resurrection was about to take place. The journey with Jesus, as we've been tracking this story and journeying with him to the cross, is about to get real ugly. It's about to get real ugly. Um, so what went wrong? You say, this is God's story. How does God's story get real ugly? What went wrong? Did God's plan fail? Did God's plan fail? No. Nope. It's really the same issue we all have dealt with concerning God. And what is that? What is that uh, human dilemma, as I will call it? What is that? The magical answer is this, per se... Jesus didn't meet their expectations. Hmm. That's a realistic thought, isn't it? Do you realize this has always been the human dilemma? In your mind, in my mind, in this world's mind, it's brought people to tears, confusion, chaos, abandonment of God, God doesn't meet our expectations at times. But does he not? God not meeting our expectations? How does that work out in our minds? And here's just a few thoughts. How does that work out? If we could pull that up. God didn't do what I asked. Right? It's a real thought, feeling, maybe you've said that in your mind before, said it out loud to a loved one. I know this world has said it. The world is filled with it, right? God didn't do what I asked. God allowed that to happen, or this or that to happen, right? And what do people typically do? When God doesn't meet their expectations, they wander and they walk away. There is no God. Because if God were real, he would listen to me and hear me and do what I want him to do. If there was a God, he would have. Would have what? Would have many of things. God isn't real because there's so much evil. Right? You hear that one a lot. You, you should hear that around the workplace or amongst wherever you go. Ah, there's so much evil in this world. God isn't really real. God doesn't exist because he would crush all this evil. Yes, that's the point of the cross. He destroyed evil utterly. He, he smashed it and crushed it and rose from the dead, right? That's the Easter story. But people grapple with these thoughts and they walk away and they wander from God because God doesn't meet their expectations. What God? He didn't hear my prayer. Right? 
God didn't stop it from happening. You know, my mom passed away in this past November. And to be completely honest with you, it blindsided me. It's not the way I thought her story was going to end on earth. We were getting, getting her to the best medical attention, to the best doctors that we could physically do here on earth as a family. Doing our very best. And yet God chose to take her home. And many of our other loved ones here, because we went through as a church from basically August to uh, the first of the year, one loved one after another loved one got called home. We went through that as a congregation. And no, I want to say this, it was not COVID related, all COVID related at all. So I had a choice, right, as a a Christian man, or we have a choice, we had a choice as a family, well, God didn't answer our prayer. We laid hands on her, we did all the stuff that we're supposed to do, yet God called her home. So what are we supposed to do with that? Are we supposed to pout and get mad at God and walk away from him and say, God, you're a great big meanie in the sky, you didn't heal my mom? And the world is filled with those sort of thoughts. People carry those, those weights from childhood all the way millions of people are carrying those. God did not meet my expectation, therefore there is no God. And if there was a God, he's certainly dead now because he's not hearing anything. And we grapple with that. When God doesn't meet our uh, expectations. The rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19 verse 16. This guy thought he was wise and he probably was. And he comes to Jesus. I'm paraphrasing the story. You know it probably well some of you. This, this rich man comes to Jesus. He says, Jesus. He goes, what must I do to get into heaven? And Jesus replies to him, you know, hey. Keep the law. And he starts naming different laws. Obey your parents. Love your father and mother. Do not steal. And this rich young ruler, he, he's very excited. He says, great, Jesus. All these I have kept. All of them. Since I was a very young man. Jesus says, that's good. He goes, now, I'm going to tell you something. Go sell your possessions and give it to the poor and then come follow me. And this rich young ruler instantaneously he had, he, had, he had followed the Lord and God's commands all of his life, but Jesus told him something a little bit bigger than his expectations because he was a man of wealth. Jesus says, go sell your possessions and give it to the poor and then come follow me. In other words, your money is yanking you this way and that way and taking you off center from me. And the man's face was downcast and he walked away sorrowful and sad because he was a man of much wealth. And so you must have to ask, you have to ask yourself a question, what went wrong there in that guy's mind? It's pretty simple. God didn't meet his expectations. He was expecting something different. And so he walked away for the living Savior, Savior right? He walked away. And so we have a choice to make in our lives. Because I'll be honest with you, a lot of times, God doesn't make sense. Right? He just doesn't. But he always makes sense in the heavenly. He does. Listen, when God doesn't make, when God doesn't do what we want, plan, or desire, he's ridiculed, mocked, forgot about, or dismissed. Jesus and his disciples on the journey with Jesus were just miles from their final destination, the holy city of Jerusalem. If we could pull that map up there. 
they were at Bethany or Bethpage, and Jesus was just about, he sent the, we're going to read that in a second, he sent his disciples ahead, and that was kind of the route. I just wanted to show you that. They had made it all the way through Galilee and all the surrounding towns, Samaria. We talked about that in our journey, and now they're just getting ready to enter the holy city, into the temple. And Jesus takes his friends aside. And Jesus does what he does best, just like he does us. He looks us right in the eyes, and he tells us the truth. Are you hearing me, church? He, he, he took his, his, his best team, his, his most loved ones, and that went with him and walked with him, and he took them to the side, and he looked them right in their face, and he sat them down. And this is what he said, taken from Luke 18, 31 through 34. We are going up to Jerusalem. And everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. Praise God. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. Here's where it gets dicey. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. Hallelujah. But listen to what happened in the disciples' mind. Because they had a different theology, different teaching, rabbinical teaching. The disciples did not understand any. And this is the third time, mind you, Clayton talked about it last week. This is the third time that Jesus told them plainly, hey, listen, this is God's plan. I'm not hiding it under a bushel. I'm telling you plainly that I'm going to the cross. And yet they failed to recognize Jesus' words and take them in because why? God did not meet their expectations, their plan, their theology. She was like, no, nah, Jesus, what the heck are you talking about, dude? Somebody put something in your drink, Jesus? I mean, you're going to be mocked? I mean, these words here? Disciples didn't understand. Handed over, mocked, spit on, insulted, flogged, and killed. It says the meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. Why was it hidden from them? Third time. Were they hardheads like me, like you? Some of us, I guess. Probably so. But Jesus was speaking to them. Jesus' word came true. They were trustworthy and true. And so for the third time, they what? They hardened their hearts. They did not want to accept this suffering servant Messiah. They didn't have a theology for that. And so they said, Jesus must be drinking the wrong Kool-Aid. And they hardened their hearts and they said, no, no, no. Jesus, what the heck are you talking about? Mocked and flogged and killed. And so we say, why didn't they get it? And again, we say they didn't understand it because it didn't fit into their plans or expectations. Honestly, if you look at the big picture and how I would do things, that's the problem. We get wrapped up in our own thoughts and mind, and we sometimes become our own little gods, don't we? Let's be honest. We become our own little gods and we want to dictate what the next step is or we want to dictate how we're going to do this or that thing. And we don't even take time to pray to the living God and say, is this what I'm supposed to do? Is this the way I'm supposed to spend my money? Is this the way this decision I'm supposed to go? Which way or the other way, Lord? We just do it because we become our own gods. Just being honest. It just didn't make sense to them. Jesus was supposed to be, understand something, the war hero. That's what they were taught in the Jewish culture, that there would be a Messiah to come, and he would ride in, he would sit on the throne of David, and he was going to be our war hero. He was going to annihilate uh, the Gentiles, the Romans, and he was going to set up his throne 
on earth. But Jesus said to them in John 18, 36, and they weren't paying attention to this either, my kingdom is not of this world. Praise God for that. Let me remind you, this is not our home. <laughs> Praise God. Do I get an amen? Are you a little bit dead this morning? This place is not our home until it's restored to the new heaven and the new earth and all of the chaos and the lies and the turmoil and the death and the destruction will go away, vanish away. Amen? Because of Jesus. And I long for that time. I even say, now, Lord, to protect some innocent people. Seriously. To protect some innocent people out there. Jesus said to them, you got plans in your minds, but my kingdom is not of this world. Praise God. A perfect kingdom filled with no more pain, doubt, sorrow, sickness, disease. Jesus says in Revelation, for the old order of things has passed away. Behold, I am making everything new. New mind, new body, new soul, a, a steady waistband. Right? We don't have to worry about that anymore, right? We don't have to worry about it at the cake auction. We can just, uh, I'm going to bid on that one, Jesus. Give me that one. And we're just going to eat to our heart's content and not gain a pound. <laughs> right? My kingdom is not of this world. And here's what happened next. The triumphal entry as we know it in Scripture. Now, I have put, and you'll notice in your app, I'm not going to repeat all of the verses there, but I've combined all of the four Gospels of the triumphal entry uh, to this uh, reading that I'm going to read, all taken from Scripture. Let's read. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent out two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there. How did Jesus know that, by the way, right? He knows all things. Which no one has ever ridden. Very important. Read the commentary in the app. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Tell him the Lord needs it and he will send it back there shortly or here shortly. Now... A donkey was like stealing a car, just to put it in context. Like, it was like stealing a car. It was that serious. Like, you seen somebody like, hey, that's my truck. Don't touch my car, right? Hey, I need that. So he said, Jesus made, made sure. He's like, look, it, I'm just borrowing your car. How would you like that if somebody just came into your driveway, you saw somebody, and they just hop in there and said, hey, hey don't worry about it. Don't come out. I'm just, I'm just borrowing your car right now. So Jesus made sure, right? And it says this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Zechariah. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. They went and found a colt inside the street, tied it at the doorway, tied it at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing? Untying that colt. They answered as Jesus had told them to do, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut from the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Here it is, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Some of the Pharisees, the religious leaders who had a different plan, right? Some of them said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. How dare you? How dare they call you Hosanna? Jesus said, I tell you, I love this, man, I love this. If they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. 
the stones will cry out. If they keep quiet, the stones will praise the name of Jesus. As he approached Jerusalem, very important here, and he saw the city, the holy city, it says he wept over it. Jesus wept over the holy city of God, and he said to them, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. Like, in other words, I am coming to you, humbly coming to you on a colt. I am here, I am the Messiah, and I'm here to give you peace. But now it has been hidden from your eyes, because what? It didn't meet their expectations, their plans. The days will come, Jesus said, upon you, when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. There's a wrathful judgment part of God. He was prophetically speaking what was to come. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children, within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another. Why did this happen? Here's what Jesus says. Because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Because you didn't recognize the Messiah, the one the Old Testament uh, prophesied about, talked about, which you studied all of these years, even as a, a good little Jewish child being sat down on the stories over and over again. You did not recognize God coming to you because you had different plans. And now there's going to be a time of sorrow coming to the holy city. And as we know it, if we study history, in 70 AD, it was completely crushed. The holy city of Jerusalem ransacked. And as we move to a close this morning, let's just be honest. God doesn't always make sense to us. I really do. And you probably do too. I got a lot of questions, Lord. But you know, just think about this. We grumble and complain a lot as Americans. And I know I'm just probably speaking about myself. But think about this. You get up in the morning, get in your car, it's early, and you're heading to work. And on the way to work, you get a flat tire. That's a bummer, right? You get a flat tire, and now you got to change that tire, and you're ranting and raving, and you're not even awake yet because you didn't get your coffee or Red Bull or whatever you drink, maybe water or whatever. And you're ranting and raving about that flat tire, and you're like, man, now i got to get out, and do I call AAA if you have that, or I, do I get out and with my blood, sweat, and tears change this tire? And you grumble, and you complain. But what if God was on the move in your life? What if you got that flat tire at that particular time on the road at the precise timing of it because you didn't know three miles up the road you're about to cross the crossroad of let's use Dryden Road. And if you would have crossed Dryden Road at approximately 714, there would have been somebody who went or would have ran a red light and smashed you to pieces and put you in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. But God in his mercy and all of our grumbling and complaining gave you a flat tire. Think about that. That's how God works in our lives. And it doesn't make sense, and we don't understand it. We just put air in that tire. I just checked it. In fact, that tire is stinking brand new. <laughs> right? But God, think about that the next time you run into an obstacle. I want to close with these spiritual applications to take to heart. When God doesn't make sense, what do we do? We trust in the Lord with all of our heart. Trust in the Lord with all of our heart. 
And lean not on your own understanding. Because, friends, your own understanding at many times is not heavenly. In all your ways acknowledge him. And what will he do? He will make your path straight. Number two. Understand you're not God. Even though you think you are at times. As Americans, we... we I'll change that. I'll fix him or her. Right? We like to take charge. You're not God. You can't undo the past. And you certainly don't hold the future in your hands. Praise God you don't. Praise God I don't. Right? Can we call fire down from heaven? <laughs> If you're tracking the sermon, right? The disciples said, can we just call fire down from heaven and get rid of these folks? It's like, if I was God. Number three, when God doesn't make sense, what do we do? God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. That's the word of God. We've got to submit to his sovereignty, even when it doesn't make sense. And number four, here's the thing, here's the, here's the tire scenario. All things work out for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. You can take that to the bank, it's God's word. And sometimes you just get flat tires, glory to God. Just say that the next time your tires look, glory to God. Right? Think about it though. Here's where a lot of trouble happens in this world. Number five, don't blame God for Satan's lies and destruction. Isn't that the truth? I and mean, when we blame God like, well, you know, all this stuff's going on in this world. And boy, it, no, hey, there's a devil who's here to kill, steal, and destroy. And he's whispering into a lot of our politicians' ears, and they're listening to it, and they're loving it, and they're acting out. It's just the truth. Number six, you may never get an answer to your tough, I just wrote that this morning, so anyway, tough questions until you get to heaven. That's just the truth. You may not ever know an answer to those tough questions until you get to heaven. You know what? That's okay with me. Because I serve a living God. And I trust him with all my heart. And I lean not on my own understanding. Let's stand and close in prayer.